May I say something to you? I was really praying. I, I was not, you know, I, I, I finished up with that announcement uh, about the toys and the whatever. But I want to say to you what I said to the kids and the youth about water baptism. I was re I have really been praying about that. Really been praying about that. And that's a prayer that God has put on my heart some time ago. Um, months ago, so I've really been praying for that. Some of you, uh, this is a decision, especially if there are children under your care, you know their ages, um, there, there comes the time and the point when they understand what it means, or they understand part of it. If they are young, when they're quite young when they're baptized, a lot of times they don't understand everything. But I do want to say this, if your child understands enough to know the significance of it, and you know that your child really has Jesus in his heart, and there is an eager desire to be baptized, my feeling is God touches young hearts. He really does. He touches young hearts. And when there is an eagerness and a zeal, I want to be, it can be, that is, the, I feel, that's the time. Because God is dealing with their hearts. And when it's fresh, when it's life, that's, that's when you want to move. That's when you want to let them respond to the Lord. Um, but God, I've been praying that God, as parents, God would give you wisdom as well for your, um, for your youth and for, your, and for your young people in this area. But I want to let you know this was not done casually and I didn't just say, oh, I'm going to talk to the kids. This has been a prayer on my heart as your pastor for the last few months and for your children. We we'll want to tell you also, a lot of you are not here at, in the first hour during the prayer time. We really prayed for the kids of Lighthouse and for the youth of Lighthouse today. We called out their names, all of them. We called out their names um, this morning because God loves children and youth are a treasure from the Lord and the enemy wants to, to steal that treasure away from us. But it's a treasure from God. And he's able to protect and keep. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, let's turn to the word this morning as we continue. Worthy to suffer disgrace. We're not, this is not a new section, but we are finishing up chapter 5 this morning. Okay? And this is, we know, we know what's happening. What happens at the beginning of chapter 5? Dramatic. Ananias and Sapphira are, are, uh, are uh, struck down because of their hypocrisy and their lying, because of the danger to the church. And it's a good reminder and it's a good lesson for us that God has not changed the way he thinks about double standards in the lives of Christians in his church. Okay? God has not changed. He feels the same way. And so this morning, if we, all of us, if this is a nice face that we have, but we are outside of this nice face deliberately, deliberately, not I fall on, Lord, I'm sorry, and then we get up and we walk again. Not that, not that. But if there's a deliberate attempt to portray that we are something we are not or to deceive, the Lord is serious about it. And the, the lesson of Ananias and Sapphira is a good one for us. It helps us to, it helps us to remember how God, feels about, um, how God feels about sin. And so this is how chapter 5 begins. And then we looked at this church, this early church, and God intends for his church, I think, to be the same always, always, in any culture, in any time period. I, that's what I think. Um, I read, I've got all sorts of commentaries on the book of Acts. I have, co I have conservative ones. I have very liberal ones. I have everything in between. And I read all sorts of things. Um, I even read some because there are some good points in it as I'm studying. I even read some that talk about all of those things were for then, but none of it is for now. That was way back then and it's not now. And it kind of grieves me when I read that because we know and we see what God is doing even today in his church. Um, and as we look at this early church, we see God's pattern and God's plan and God's work in this church. It's a pure church and it's a powerful church. And we, we talked about that. Um, I didn't read it last time, two weeks ago, because we didn't have a lot of time, but I want to read uh, to you something that Robert Murray McShane said. He was a preacher in the Church of Scotland. Some of you would know, would know of him. Uh, during the 1800s, this is what he said. He said, it is not great minds or great plans or great ideas that God uses. It is great likeness to Jesus Christ. That's what God uses. Isn't that great? 
We think, oh, if I have a great idea, that's what'll work. But it is great likeness, and that's being pure before the Lord. And then we read, as we said last time, 2 Timothy 2, 21, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. And I like this, this word utensil. Maybe we'll talk about this at another time. But here's an example for you. You know, we're so smart in some things. Let me ask you this. Uh, you got up this morning or maybe, let's say tonight, you go home this afternoon or tonight, and when you got up this morning, you were really, really busy. So when you made your cup of coffee, you didn't really wash up your dishes. You just sort of put them on the kitchen counter and you got dressed and you came to church. So on the kitchen counter at home, you have a used coffee cup and maybe a dirty plate, and maybe you ate an egg with toast for breakfast. You know how egg gets dr dried on, you it's hard to get off, isn't it? Yeah, and you've got that dirty fork there and you stirred your coffee and so your coffee spoon is still there and, and you're usually clean, but this morning you were in a hurry and so you left it there on the kitchen counter and you came out to church. You go in this afternoon or tonight and you think, I'm hungry, I want a cup of coffee when you get home. And you go into the kitchen. I ask you something very simply this morning. Are you going to say, hey, that's convenient. I'll just use the fork that I used this morning. There's that spoon. I used it this morning. <laughs> it's only a little bit dirty. You're going to pick up that spoon that you used this morning that's just sitting on the, on the counter? Is that what you're going to do? Or are you going to go over to the drawer where the clean utensils are? You're going to open that drawer and you're going to take out something clean, a clean utensil. Is that what you're going to do? Of course that's what we're going to do. Don't tell me if you're going to grab the dirty one. <laughs> no, we would all go for the clean one. Now that's just a physical, that's just a natural example. All of us, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? We don't even have to use our brains to make that choice, right? But we're so smart when it comes to things like that. We're so foolish when it comes to the things of God in the same way, aren't we? We feel sometimes, I can live this way, I can do this. It doesn't matter so, so much. And we still expect, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I can work for you. I can serve you. I can say this and I can do that for you. And the Bible tells us that's not the way it is. That's not the way it works. Instead, God uses clean utensils. And so here we are. I think sometimes, not I think, there are many reasons for it, but one of the reasons that the enemy tempts us to sin, to deceitfulness, to dishonesty, to hypocrisy, to the secret things at times that we don't let people know, is that he might disqualify us for the good work that God has for us to do. Every one of us, did you know that? God has good work for you to do. And you say, well, I don't feel like that. I don't feel very this and I don't feel very that. It doesn't matter how we feel. The Bible says, the Bible says, God has good work for you to do, not somebody else, you to do. But for God to use you for that good, good work, you and I have to have clean lives that are ready for the master to use. Otherwise, we are like that dirty utensil on the kitchen counter that has dried egg on it or coffee or whatever that's sitting there, we're not ready to be used. We're not ready to be used. And instead, he go, he's going to get something that's, he's going to get someone who's, who's clean, who's ready to be used. Now, some of you right now are under such condemnation, you think, that's me. I've blown it. I'm imperfect. Remember what we said. Pure does not mean sinless. Pure means dealing with sin promptly and biblically. If we fail, if we fall, we take care of it. You take care of it right then. Get it right. Get it right. Take care of it and then keep on going. And then you're qualified for the master's use. And so... We look at this, this church that is pure, God keeps it pure. That's one of the reasons he dealt so strongly with Ananias and Sapphira right at the beginning. Struck them, struck them down, killed them to maintain the purity of his church that it might be 
a powerful church, that it might be a powerful church. And when a church is powerful, pure and powerful, it attracts people. It does. It's an attractive church. It's an attractive church. And we read this in Acts 5, 12 through 16. Next slide. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders. Oh, now you know what I would do if I were you? I would go back and read Acts 4.29. I didn't put it up here, but you remember what Acts 4, is it 4.29? Yep, 4.29 and 30. When they were threatened by the high priest, stop preaching. They go back, they pray, and what do they pray? They pray, and now, O oh Lord, stretch forth your hand. Give us boldness in, in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That's their prayer. One chapter later, we, we see the answers to the prayers, don't we? We see the answers to the prayers. Jesus keeps working, and people are attracted. And more and more people believe they're brought to the Lord. Even though Ananias and Sapphira were struck down, crowds of both men and women, look, there's the word again, crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick, those possessed by evil spirits. They were all healed. They were all healed. And today we say, well, why isn't everybody healed today? I, I don't know all of the answers to some of those things. But what I do know is this, where there is a church that is pure before the Lord, there is power in the Lord, and God moves in wonderful, wonderful ways, in wonderful ways. They were all healed. So we see God establishing his church and growing his church. And so a crowd follows. It is attractive to people. And what happens? Acts 5, verse 17. The Sadducees and the high priests, they were Sadducees. They see what's going on and they're filled with jealousy. I want you to notice something this morning. It, it doesn't even say they were disturbed because the apostles were preaching about Jesus and they had told them, don't preach in the name of Jesus. What is the foundation for their action in arresting the apostles? What is it? Jesus. Pure old jealousy. Pure old jealousy. Now, jealousy outside the church is ugly and brings damage and danger, as you know, right? As we know. Let me tell you something else. Jealousy inside the church is even worse. It's even worse. And what I have found most of the time, most Christians, to some extent, struggle with jealousy in the church. True or not true? We look at someone. Well, why are they on the board? I'm qualified. Why am I not on the board? Well, why does she get to sing back up? She's only been at Lighthouse nine months. I've been here four years. I sing as well as she does. I play the guitar as well as he does. And he, he hit a wrong chord this morning. <laughs> In the first service, I said that. And Chris just laughed, and I said, Chris, you didn't hit a wrong chord this morning. And Chris said, yeah, I really did. <laughs> which is one of the reasons, he, I think he has stepped out now, which is one of the reasons we love our worship leaders because they, and our worship team because they, they work, they lead and they work in humility and not in the flesh. And we appreciate that so much, don't we, at Lighthouse? But I will tell you, all of us, we struggle at times with jealousy. Why does this person get more attention than I do? Don't, don't, don't we, we all, don't we? There's, there's, there's this pull because that's the human nature. It really is. That's human nature. And so what do we do about it? It's so damaging. It's so dangerous. Brothers and sisters, we got to kill it in our hearts and in our lives. And when we recognize it for what it is, we say, oh God, that's ugly and that's not like you. Would you, Lord, I'm sorry for that. Take it out of my heart. Lord, I'm not going to give it any place. Because it can start small in our hearts. But when jealousy stays in our hearts and lives, what happens? Does it just stay in our hearts? Never. It always comes out, doesn't it? And it will come out in criticism. It will come out in gossip. It will come out in backbiting. It will come out in slander. It will come and it will, be, it will, it will poison us and it will damage the church of God. And so we, we deal with it. Um, years ago, I think, I don't know if mom, maybe I've told you this, this story before, but I was thinking about this one, this, this jealousy that is so ugly. It's so, so ugly to God. Um, years ago, it was when mom and dad were in the U.S. 
at the church in, the st uh, in, in New Brockton years and years ago, Mom noticed that one of the women in the church one week kind of stayed away and kind of seemed like, like this. And she thought, is something wrong? What's wrong? And another week passed, and the lady was still the same way. And so Mom, being so full of grace, you know, I, and we all can learn from her, being so full of grace, Mom went to this sister and said, because we were in the South, and she said, Sister A, I'll just call her Sister A, Sister A, is everything okay? Is something wrong? Have I offended you in some way? Do you know what the answer was? Well... Yes, Sister Nolan, I noticed two weeks ago that you spent longer shaking hands with Sister B than you did with me. <laughs> True story. Can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Brothers and sisters, jealousy, it comes from the devil, and it's ugly. It's ugly. And so we deal with it. And we come back. They're motivated by jealousy. Why are they jealous? Because the apostles are getting more attention than they are. Why are they jealous? Because in the apostles' eyes, uh, in the, sorry, in the Sadducees' eyes, they are more popular, right? They're more popular than we are. They're at such a fleshly and a carnal level. And so what do they do? And by the way, as we go through this, you're going to see this morning, as we look at several things, we look at this story and we see it as a, uh, we see it as a story about persecution of the church and then God delivers it, delivers them. And that is true. But we find little lessons all the way through this. We really, really do. And here's one of them. Here's one of them about, about jealousy. And so they, out of jealousy, they're more popular than we are. The Sadducees arrest the apostles. They arrest the apostles and they throw them in the public jail. They throw them in the public jail. They don't realize we're fighting against God. How many of you, have, have you ever tried to fight against God before? I have. Guess what? I always lose when I fight against God. And so will you. We lose when we fight against God. But the Sadducees arrest the apostles. They throw them in the public jail. The public jail is a terrible place. It's a terrible place. And I can just imagine what they're thinking. Ha! We put them in the public jail. No sanitation. You know what I mean when I say that, right? No sanitation. Little to no food. Dark, cold, stinky, awful, with murderers, with thieves, with everybody else in there, and they throw these godly men into the public jail. But as we said, bars are no obstacle for God. They're no obst for, obstacle for God. And what does he do? Next part. But an angel of the Lord came at night, sent by God, and he opened the gates of the jail, and he brought them out. And then he brought them out. Here's a footnote for this. I think God has a good sense of humor. Do you know why? The Sadducees who do this do not believe in angels. They don't believe them. They think there are no angels. They don't exist. I think God has a sense of humor. I really do. Because they're the ones in charge and God says, I'm going to send an angel to release my servant. Brothers and sisters, we look at this and we can believe it because it's in the Bible. We say, yes, I accept that. But we look at this and we think, but not today, right? We think, could something like this happen today? No, no, no. This, is, this was back then. I, I want to tell you that our God is still the same God. And there are things like this that still happen today, that still happen today. One of them, you read the story of the heavenly man, Brother Yun of China, God did something exactly like this. And like Peter, a little bit later when you read the story of Peter being released. Exactly like this. By the way, we have that book in English in the, in the uh, library. And it's also, you can buy it in Chinese as well. It will challenge you to stop living an ordinary Christian life. It really will. It really will. And so he gives them the message. He says, go to the temple. Give the people this message of life. We talked about this last time. If we were doing this, we would do it a different way, right? If we were, if we were released from prison, we would then say, now, go hide. I've gotten you out, and I don't want you to get arrested again. But instead, God's plan is turn right around and go right back to the place, go right back to the lion's den. Go right to the temple. 
and the apostles knowing, knowing this is going to cause trouble. Have you ever tried to take the easy road because you don't want trouble? I have. Let's take the easy road. I, I, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, God, I want to obey you, but let's take the easy road. Let's take the... Now, here's another lesson for us this morning. Here's a small lesson for us this morning. God trusts his apostles enough to know, I can say, do this, and they're going to do it. So I have a question for you and for me this morning to consider. Can God trust us enough with a command that may be a little bit tough to follow, but he knows I can count on them to do what I said to do? It's not going to be easy for them, but I know them, and I know they're going to do what I said to do. It's a lesson for us this morning. It really is, because the apostles know what's going to happen, and they turn right around. They don't delay. As soon as the temple gates are open at daybreak, in they go, and they don't just kind of sit there on the side. You know what you and I might do? Okay, God, I will obey you. Let me go stand in the side, and Lord, if anybody comes to me, I'll tell them about you. <laughs> But what do they do? Instead, they begin to preach and, that, and to teach. And that means to, this means to a, a public proclamation. And there they are. And so we see what God is doing. We see immediate obe obedience with the apostles. And here's something else as we look at this. What this does, when you see this, what this tells us is God's doing something big here. People know that they were arrested. People know that they were thrown in the public jail. People know they haven't had a trial yet. How is it possible that at daybreak, these apostles are back in the temple teaching? Something miraculous had to happen. And so there's a foundation for further proclamation of the gospel. That's what's happening there. And so that's why God does it that way instead of the easy way. Hey, brothers and sisters, sometimes God does it the hard way. I always want the easy way. I always want the easy way. Don't you? I always want the easy way. God does not always do it the easy way. He sometimes has a bigger way and a harder way of doing things, but it's always a better way of doing things. And so they begin preaching. And then, meanwhile, back right next to the temple, there was a place where the Sanhedrin would gather, not in the temple, but right next to the temple. And then there's a public jail that's a little bit far away. They gather and they are ready. Can you imagine? Let's look at the next slide. Can you imagine? The Sanhedrin is thinking this. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but we can imagine. Huh. We put them in the public jail. They're going to be stinky, dirty, smelly, hungry, afraid, and begging for mercy. Begging for mercy. We've got them now. They're going to listen to us now. Instead, it's a little bit like Mary and Martha going to the, to the tomb to look for the body of Jesus and the angels say, He is not here. He is risen, just as He said. Doesn't it remind you of that just a little bit? They come back and they say, They're not there. The door is still locked. They're, they're not there. We don't know where they are. Because the Sadducees are fighting against God. They're fighting against God, and we don't win when we're fighting against God. The guards were still there. The guards were still there. And then while they're standing there, look at the next, uh, the next part, Acts 5, 24 and 25. In the meantime, the captain of the temple guards, the leading priests, they're standing this, they're shaking their head, they're scratching their head, wondering where it would all end. They know something is up. They know that something is super, they know that there's something supernatural. They don't know what it is, but they know it's supernatural. And then someone comes with the startling news, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple, they're teaching the people. I wish I could have been in that room when that message came. Don't you? I just wish. I'm afraid I'm not Christian enough. I, I might have had to laugh at the, at the high priest and the Sadducees at that because God is doing something special here. And then we see what happens next. And then uh, let's look at the next slide. What happens next? What we see here is the captain went with his temple guards, arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Okay, ready for another lesson? Here we go. Here's another small lesson again. Who are these apostles? Quick Bible quiz. Name some of the people who were part of this group. Who? Okay, Peter was the first name I heard. Who else? John. 
Who else? James. Who was the last apostle that took the place of Judas? Matthias. Okay, Matthias. So all of these. Now, I remember James and John. Do you remember James and John? They were called the sons of thunder. And when people were mean to Jesus, do you remember what James and John said? Do you want us to call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But let's go a little more recent than that. And let's go back. Here's the lesson for us. To the night in the garden, as Jesus was with his disciples, all of them, except for Judas, and there were Peter, James, and John, the closest to him, and the captain of the temple guard comes to arrest Jesus. What does Peter do? That's the first one you named. He pulls out his sword in his own strength, in his own idea, and he goes for the closest person to him, and it's the servant of the high priest, gets his ear, was aiming for his head, we are sure, but at least gets his ear. We, of course, you, th hey, come on. You think Peter was, was that, was that, had that much finesse with a sword? He was good at cutting people's ears off? Of course not. He was going for the head. There's no question about that. He gets the ear. Ear is lying on the ground, bloody. And Jesus looks at him and says, put down your sword. This is what I've come to do. And a little bit later, Jesus says, I could call 10,000 angels to deliver me. Brothers and sisters, violence and personal power, and I'm going to do it. I can do it my way in my own strength. Listen, it is always an option for you and me. I'm going to do it my way. It's always an option for us. I can, they did me, I'll get them, I'll show them. It's always an option. But that is not the way of the people who follow the Prince of Peace. And Jesus told Peter, put down your sword. He picks up that bloody ear and heals, puts it back on, and miraculously, the ear is reattached. And Peter is saved because I can tell you, Peter would have gone to the cross the next day with Jesus if that ear had remained on the ground. He, he would have. That was the high priest's servant. That was, you don't think the, the punishment would have spread further? Surely it would have. But Jesus had prayed. He says, I don't want one of these to be lost. And so he saved Peter, even in his foolish action. Now, a few months later, we come to this. Peter and the apostles could have at that moment, could have at that moment, easily could have said, hey, they're trying to arrest us, and you know we've been preaching good things, and we, have, and we have performed miracles. Help us, quick! You know what would have happened if they had done that? There would have been a riot, and the, and the, the uh, guards would have been stoned, and the apostles would not have been rearrested. But they had learned a lesson. They had learned a lesson. Do you see that with me this morning? They'd learned a lesson. My question to us this morning is this. When you and I face similar circumstances like this, we go through something tough, God speaks to us, the Holy Spirit deals with our hearts, and then we go around, and then something like that comes up again. It's the similar thing, it's the same thing again. My question for us this morning is this. Have we learned a lesson also when we face difficulties? It grieves me as a pastor when I talk with people or when I counsel people and they say, pray for me, and I'm happy to pray. I'm always happy to pray. But it grieves my heart when I see this person, it seems like, has not learned anything. It's the same old thing. It's the same old attitude. It's the same old struggle. There's been no growth. Brothers and sisters, God help us not only to deliver us when we are in tough times, but to help us grow in tough times. Amen? Help us to grow. Help us to learn something about Jesus and let it come into our hearts and lives. And we're changed by it. And we keep on going. That's one of the lessons that we see right here. Peter and John and the others, they don't say, hey, 
Help us! Instead, they meekly, they are rearrested and they go before the guards again. So we see that God is doing something. And you know what? That gives me hope for me because I know how stubborn I am. I don't know how stubborn you are. I know how stubborn I am. And I think I know how stubborn Peter was too. And if there's hope for Peter, there's hope for me. And there's hope for you as well. Amen? Amen. And so they go in, they're brought, they're brought in again, and the high priests say, didn't we tell you? I was thinking about this this morning as we were singing this, as we were singing no other name but the name of Jesus. Didn't we tell you never again to teach in, look at that, this man's name. They don't even want to say the name of Jesus, do they? They don't want to say the name of Jesus. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching about Him. And you want to make us responsible for his death. They're not, they don't want to say the name of Jesus. There's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. I've heard some of you before give personal testimonies. How when, in, in, when you were being confronted truly by demonic attacks demonic attacks and your heart was filled with fear and you felt like I can't say anything oh with the smallest little bit of strength that you had you whispered the name of Jesus and demons flee at the name of Jesus some of you will remember the story I've told you before about my grandmother long before I was born it was when my mother was a young girl and they lived in Washington, D.C. Even at that time, Washington, D.C. was a city of crime. Still, it still is today. And my grandmother my mo and mom was a small girl. And grandma was walking home from the grocery store with a bag of groceries in her arms. And as she was walking down the sidewalk, she passed by an alley. And a man in the alley reached out, grabbed her. The grocery bag of groceries fell to the ground and he dragged her backwards into the alley, put his hand over her mouth. Who knows what he was going to do to her? Who knows what? Violence and worse. Violence and worse. And he dragged her backwards with his hand over her mouth. And she finally was able just to work free her mouth. And she said one word. And she called out, Jesus! And when she said that word, that man dropped her, turned around, and ran. Brothers and sisters, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. It's not a magic charm. It's not, a, oh, if I say Jesus, then everything, it will, everything will be okay. It is the name of Jesus. And it's us with all of our hearts, with all of our confidence, say, oh, Jesus. And looking to the one who is able to save, who is able to deliver. In the day that we call upon the name of Jesus, we will be saved. We will be saved. And Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I will draw all men to me. There's power in the name of Jesus. And so, as the Sanhedrin says this to the, God, to, to the apostles as they stand there, Peter and the apostles reply. They say, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Now, brothers and sisters, it is exactly the same man, Peter, who later on, um, Michelle, go ahead and put up, put up the next verse. It is this same man who later says, uh, next, uh, next slide, sorry. The next slide. It is this same man who says we must obey God rather than man. God inspired Peter to write this also. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, every man-made organization. And brothers and sisters, there is a submission, and it's very clear, this is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. That the things, the man-made institutions that are on this earth, that though they are imperfect, though they are, though they are flawed at times, God uses them. God uses them for order in, the, in, in our world. And so when we look at what Peter said, we must obey God. God rather than any human authority. And then we look at this. We put both of these together, and this is what we do. 
This is what we do. We say, if there is no conflict, I obey man-made institutions. I obey human government. I obey all of this. I don't say, huh, this speed limit is foolish. I can go much faster here and it's safer. That is disobedience, okay, for example. Or, I don't agree with my government. I don't like the way they're spending my tax dollars, so I'm not going to pay my taxes. Nope, we pay our taxes, even if we don't agree with some of these, some of these things. But whenever there comes a point where obeying God, God's laws and man's laws, where there's a conflict, where there's a conflict, that is when we say, I obey God rather than man. Now, I want to say something to you this morning. If you have never had that point of conflict, then I, I ask you to look at your Christian life and to say, how are you living your Christian life? Because you and I in this world, there is conflict. Is there conflict all the time? No, there's not conflict all the time. But there will come the, there will come the point when, if you are going to live as a Christian and you're going to do what's right, whether it's in school, whether it's in business, whether it's in relationship, whether it's in conflict even at times with school activities and things like that, there will be a conflict. And if you've been a Christian for a while and you have never come to that place where you have, uh, go back to the, to the earlier slide again, where you have had to say, I'm going to obey God rather than human authority, then I think you're taking the easy road to avoid conflict. That's, I think so, because we're Christians living in this world. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to be God's people, there's a price to pay. There really is. There's a price to pay. And I want to say something to those of you that are younger as well. You may be a younger person, but I want to tell you something. Do you know what? As a young person, there's a price to pay as a young person, too. There really is. It may not be money out of your pocket. It may be loss of friends. It may be scorn. It may be people laughing at you for something that you've chosen to do. If you're an adult and you're working, it may mean that you lose some job opportunities. If you are working in a home for an employer, it may mean that you are mistreated if you say, no, I'm going to, I must obey God. I must do what is right. But brothers and sisters, there's a cost to pay for being a Christian. How do you count the cost? You count the cost not just by what it costs you, but by what it cost Jesus for your sake to bear your sins to the cross. That's what we do. That's when we say, okay, it's going to cost me this, but this is what it costs Jesus. And so the apostles come to that and they say, no, we must obey God rather than man. Now, what's it going to cost them right now? It looks like it's going to cost them death, doesn't it? They are so angry, the high council decides we're going to kill them. We're going to kill them. Off with their heads. In effect. In effect. And then we find something else. Move forward to uh, 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 next slide and the next slide again as we move forward. Look at this. And I want you to see this. Suddenly, we find a secret weapon. Did you know that God has secret weapons everywhere? Did you know that? God has secret weapons everywhere. And in this situation, the secret weapon is a man called who? Gamaliel. Who is Gamaliel? What do we know about him? We know that he was one of the most respected teachers in all Israel. He was not a Christian. He was not a friend of Jesus. Every once in a while, some commentator will say, he must have been a secret Christian. I don't think so. You know why else? Because Gamaliel was the teacher of who? Paul. He was the teacher of Paul, that zealous man who wanted to drag Christians off to prisons and to, and to execute them for following Jesus and giving up, the, as he sought, the law of Moses. Gamaliel was Paul's teacher. And Gamaliel stands up. God al Listen, God always has secret weapons. He does. God can use anybody he wants to. God can even use his 
enemies because he's God. He's God. And Gamaliel stands up and he says, hey, wait a minute. Take care of what you're planning to do to these men. And then look at the next one. He says, he gives some good advice and he says, leave these men alone. If this is from God, you won't be able to overthrow. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. This is good advice. And God uses his secret weapon and they are not killed. Victory, sort of. They're not killed, but it's going to hurt before they get out of this jam, isn't it? Because what happens? They accept his advice. They call on the apostles, and then what do they do? They flog them. What is flogging? Flogging is the same thing that Jesus received before he went to the cross. 39 lashes. Their clothes would have been partially pulled off. They would have gotten guards with a special whip. It wasn't just any old whip for flogging. There was a special whip that had usually three strong ropes that were twisted, and twisted into the rope would be pieces often of stone or other sharp things that as it hit the back, it would tear the skin. And so God delivers them, sort of. Sort of. Has God ever delivered you, sort of? That's what it feels like, right? You've prayed, God deliver me, and he sort of does. Is that a half deliverance or not a deliverance? Here's the other lesson for us as we come to a close this morning. There's a price to pay at times for standing up for God. I want to be completely delivered without paying a price, but there's sometimes a price to pay. And so they're flogged. And now here's the lesson for us. How do the apostles respond? Let's look at the next slide. It says, as we come to a close, they left the high council blaming God because they had obeyed God and God had allowed them to be flogged and they went back to their homes and said, we're not going to preach the gospel anymore. No. What does it say? It says they left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, can God count on us that when we are delivered, sort of, that we can go through suffering and we can count it with great rejoicing. I am worthy, O oh Lord. Thank you that you have counted me worthy to suffer disgrace to bear your name because I'm identified with you. They see Jesus in me. I'm standing for you. And if there's disgrace and shame, thank you, Lord. God has to do this in our hearts, in our lives. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they continue to preach and t teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. And we close with this. Last slide. This is for your homework this week. The same man who doesn't do violence, the same man who says submit to every human institution, the same man who walks out of the temple rejoicing, his back bloody and broken and bruised, his clothes torn, writes precious words, words that he paid a price for in his life, he writes, don't be surprised at the trials you're going through. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Be happy when you're insulted. There's no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. And if you keep on suffering, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Stop looking at suffering as God's failure to deliver you and instead say, oh God, you have counted me worthy to live for you and to shine for you. Thank you, Lord. He will never fail you. Let's close in prayer this morning.
Lord, we thank you for these words this morning. We thank you for our brother Peter, who paid a price to write these words. And so, Lord, we trust them because we trust you and we trust your servant who is inspired to write these words to us. Lord, help us to take these lessons to our heart. We thank you for our brothers, these apostles, who lived long before us, but have given us an example to follow that's a good example, that's a good example, and is a practical example for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, brothers and sisters. Greet one another in the Lord. Go up to the fourth floor.